Hello everyone. Thank you for standing by and welcome to Helping Your Toddler Talk, sponsored by ISIS Parenting and presented by Megan Rosantis. My name is Nancy Holtzman. I'm the Vice President of Clinical Content here at ISIS Parenting, and I'm a Nurse Lactation Consultant and Maternal Infant Developmental Specialist. I'll be serving as your moderator this evening. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. However, you may submit questions by typing them through the chat feature located to the left of your screen. We'll try to save time to answer plenty of questions at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded, and all of you will receive a link to the recording probably tomorrow. So if you miss something or need to step away from your computer for any reason, that's okay. ISIS Parenting is proud to host this evening's webinar. ISIS is the nation's most trusted prenatal and early parenting destination. We provide innovative programs and a highly edited selection of products for expecting new families in our four Boston area centers and, of course, online at isisparenting.com. As I mentioned, I'm Nancy Holtzman, and I'm your moderator this evening. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter for this evening, Megan Rosantis. Megan earned her Master's of Science in Communication Disorders at the University of Tulsa. She's a certified member of the American Speech Language Hearing Association and the founder of Chatterbox's Pediatric Speech Language Pathology Program based in Newton, Massachusetts. Megan's passion and enthusiasm for working with young children as a speech language pathologist serves as the cornerstone of Chatterbox's core values and standards. Megan is a member of the American Academy of Private Practice in Speech Pathology and Audiology and the Asperger's Association of New England and is an active supporter of Autism Speaks. Megan is a regular contributor to speech language publications and serves as a consultant to many local private schools. Welcome, Megan. Thank you so much for having me today, Nancy. It's such a pleasure to be able to collaborate with you. As a mom myself and graduate of ISIS's Great Beginnings class, I really value all of the resources and support that you provide for ISIS as ISIS for new moms like myself. It's an honor to be here. Let's jump in tonight by looking at communication as a whole. As speech language pathologists, we break down communication into expressive language and receptive language. Expressive language is the language that an individual produces. Expressive language begins with the use of gestures and sounds and progresses up to the production of sentences in a conversation. You may think of expressive language as the output of language or how one expresses his wants and needs. This definitely includes words, but also the grammar rules that dictate how words are combined into phrases. It's also the usage of nonverbal cues like pointing and facial expressions. Speech production, on the other hand, relates more to the formulation of individual speech sounds using one's lips, teeth, and tongue. Speech production can also be referred to as articulation. It's important to remember that speech production and articulation are separate from one's ability to formulate, formulate thoughts that are expressed using words. Receptive language is the language input that an individual understands. Receptive tasks include being able to identify objects and actions, act out, or follow directions. Your child may be using his receptive language when you read a book together and ask him questions like, where's the dog? Or point to the car. Receptive language goes beyond just vocabulary skills but is the ability to interpret a question, understand concepts like on, or interpret complex grammatical forms, like understanding the phrase, the boy was kicked by the girl, means that the girl did the kicking. A child typically develops receptive language first. You can think of children as sponges who first absorb all of the rules and the usage of language before they begin to express themselves using each of these language skills. We're going to focus most of our information this evening on the time where language really begins to burst and develop, roughly starting around 18 months. But it's important to cover an overview of early language development to get to that point. So I'll take this area with some input from Megan, since I work uh, quite a bit with 
young infants, and even during the first weeks, you know that your voice is already familiar to a newborn because he's been listening to you in utero from about 20 weeks of gestational age. And using a high-pitched, sing-songy tone of voice is a little annoying for you, but it is going to attract your baby's attention. We call that mother ease, or to be a little bit more politically correct, you can call that parent ease. And your baby will also definitely pay more attention when you exaggerate your facial expressions when you sing to him or talk to him. Probably by three to four months, you'll begin to have some cooing conversations. Just narrate your regular daily activities as you change your baby's diaper, give him a bath, go upstairs, talk to him about what you're doing, and ask him a lot of questions. Notice he's going to listen to you attentively, and he'll try so hard to make sounds to respond. When your baby makes a little grunt or a sighing sound in response, respond back. This is the beginning of the give and take of conversation. You'll also notice that your baby starts bringing his hands to his mouth and using his lips and his tongue more. By five months, your baby's going to be juicy. The hands are stuffed in the mouth and that drool is flowing and he's going to use his lips and his tongue and that saliva to make interesting new sounds. So this is where you'll start hearing raspberries and little grunts and squeals and even little coughs. And a lot of parents with five-month-olds worry that their baby has a new cough, but it's really all that saliva collecting in the back of the throat. And as your baby learns an early form of communication, he's found that when he makes that coughing sound, mom comes running and looks concerned. So it's not manipulation, it's communication. By six months, you'll probably be hearing more consonants, and I often joke that agu and inga have arrived to your house because those are very popular uh, six-month-old baby sounds, agu. You may also hear um, ba sounds, da, and sometimes it will sound like your baby says ma or no when they're crying. Uh, he'll recognize his name sometimes and will probably have some very favorite songs for you to sing that he'll respond to with delight. This is a fun age, seven to 12 months. So you'll begin to notice that your baby pays attention so much more and recognizes certain words. It's a great time to begin using modified American Sign Language. You'll definitely hear more complicated, complex language sounds, babbling, more consonants, and now some rising and falling intonations that begin to sound a little bit more like language. By the time your baby is close to his first birthday, there'll probably be more attempts to communicate. He may re reach his hands out to indicate up. He may uh, gesture or point to things. Um, cueing behaviors, like you may be able to say wave bye-bye and your baby will do that on cue, usually uh, with a little bit of a delayed response, but he, he knows what wave bye-bye means. Um, and uh, you could say, where's your book? And he'll look for the book. Um, the American Sign Language is very beneficial. Some of my favorite early signs to work on are things like milk, more, all done, up, book, ball, dog, the things that you can reinforce throughout the day with your baby and the things that interest your baby. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, your baby may try to move and sing to music, uh, shake his head no, begins to understand a lot more, um, and even close to a year may have a couple of words that only the parents understand. So it may be something like buh, but mother knows that that means ball or book or bottle, and that's also why using sign is so helpful because you can really help differentiate what that sound means when it's paired with a sign. In terms of uh, this next time frame, you'll notice that gestures and language and jargoning and cadence all begin to come together. So your babies will make quite a bit of sounds that begin to sound more and more like language and there may be some words mixed in. Um, most of the earliest words start with consonants like P, B, and M sounds um, and often uh, you'll see that your baby will have particular words that you may understand, but, you're, but other people will not. So you will be the interpreter. In fact, somebody asked today, is it normal that, uh, that their child talks but still needs Nana or Mom to interpret for others? Uh, the understanding and the interaction of, of simple instructions is a really fun time in this period and really emphasizes what Megan was saying earlier about receptive language. So this is the time where you can look at a book together and say, you know, do, can you find the dog? Um, what's in, is that, a, you know, show me the sun in the sky and your, your baby will point to these things if you do these routinely. But if you pointed to the dog and said, what is that? Your baby may not be able to form the words. He knows it's the dog, he can point to it, but he may not be able to say it. He could sign it though. Um, and uh, even toward uh, the 18th month, 
some babies may only have a handful of words and some may be regular chatterboxes and have 50 words, some of which other people can understand at this point. Uh, but this really is the, the language burst time and the time where, um, where both uh, uh, great gains are made or the beginning of noticing perhaps a lag is noticed. Yes, Nancy, language development really takes off like a rocket around 18 months. New talkers start making incredible strides in language development, and they're adding new words to the vocabulary at an amazing rate. So it's, it's referred to as the language explosion. Um, and, and during this time, a toddler's word bank grows from the precious one or two words at age one to 1,000 to 2,000 words by his third birthday. So there's a lot going on in this time frame. Um, so I thought it would be helpful to take a closer look at both receptive and expressive communication milestones for children ages 18 months to age three. So starting with the first group here, um, 18 months to age two. Receptively at this age, children are able to identify photographs of familiar objects. So when you're reading a book with your child, like Nancy said, you should be, they should be able to point to common objects, like point to the bird or point to the balloon. Um, they're understanding inhibitory words like stop or wait. They can identify body parts on themselves or on a doll, like show me your tummy, where's your ear, touch your head. Um, understanding verbs in context, such as this bear is hungry, can you give him something to eat? Or Teddy looks tired, make Teddy go to sleep. So acting out those commands receptively is something that will start to emerge. Expressively, kids at this age are using about eight to ten single words. Some of the first words to be um, used are oftentimes mommy or daddy. They may do a lot of imitation of single words, um, like uh, cookie, if you use sort of a sing-song voice, cookie, they may imitate cookie or some type of an approximation of what you said. They may use some two-word combinations like go, car, or where mommy, me, um, and producing different consonant vowel combinations to label toys and objects. Um, and by consonant vowel combinations, to give you an example, the word go would be a consonant vowel, the word mop would be a consonant vowel consonant, and the word papa would be consonant vowel consonant vowel. So we're looking for all these different phonetic makeups in, in their single word vocabulary. They may be also combining words with gestures at times to let you know what they want or what they want to do. So a child may point to the milk and also say more, just asking for more milk by using one gesture and one word. They may use some inflection at the end of their voice to show that they're asking you a question. Mommy? This has been, definitely become popular, um, a new skill for my daughter, especially in the car. Mommy? 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 Which I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> in terms of play, um, kids are imitating housework activities. They're grouping objects in play, like putting all of the ducks together, all of the cars together. They use two toys together in pretend play, like laying down with a baby under a blanket and pretending to nap. Jumping to the next age category, um, we'll take a look at age two to two and a half. By age two, um, kids are identifying clothing items on themselves, so they can identify their shoes and socks or pants. Um, they're starting to use spatial concepts or prepositional phrases, like um, put the blocks in the box or take the blocks off of the box. They're recognizing actions in pictures or stories. So when looking at a story together, they may be able to identify the child who is sleeping or the child who is jumping. And then understanding several pronouns, like me, my, your, where's my cup, where's your spoon. Expressively, uh, kids are naming objects in photographs. So when looking at a book, this is when you might start introducing WH questions. What's this? Like pointing to a ball. Or what's this? Pointing to a cookie. And actually looking for the child to label the object. They may also begin asking more WH questions. Where, who, what, when, how, why, with some rising intonation at the end of the sentence. 
They're using words for various social purposes, to request a toy, to label an action, to indicate they want something to happen again. And they may also be answering yes or no questions. They're starting to also use different word combinations, like a noun plus a verb, mommy go, or a noun plus a verb plus location, daddy come here, or a verb plus a noun, push car. So these are milestones to look for at age two to two and a half. Our last milestone category is two and a half to three. By the age of two and a half, receptively, a child should be able to understand the use of objects or the function of objects. You could say, show me what you use to cook food, or show me what you watch, show me what you can ride on, or show me what you wear on your feet. They're understanding part-whole relationships at this age, like the wheel of the bike or the tail of the cat. Understanding descriptive concepts, such as small, fast, or dry. And they're able to follow two-step related and unrelated commands without any cues, like go to your room and get your shoes, or pick up that ball and give it to me. Expressively by age two and a half to three, kids are using plurals, like horses, or blocks, or babies. They're combining three plus words in spontaneous speech answering what and who questions, using action words plus the ing, like a verb plus ing, the girl is playing or singing or dancing, um, using prepositions, and then lastly, understanding quantity concepts of one versus all, like give me just one cookie or put all of the blocks in the box. With regards to play at two and a half to three, performing longer sequences of play activities, acting out a lot of familiar routines, and pretending to perform a lot of parent routines. If you ever have any questions in general about your baby's development, I think it's always important to immediately ask your pediatrician, and the sooner the better. When there even are delays, early intervention in speech and language therapy can make a significant difference. If your child ever seems to have trouble using eye gaze and gestures to get what he wants, or if he's not babbling or using other sounds, he may be at risk for a language delay. In terms of when to seek an evaluation, I would encourage parents to seek an evaluation if any of those aforementioned signs or red flags would be present or if your child is not meeting the previously mentioned developmental milestones, you may want to mention these to your child's pediatrician and raise your concerns. If your pediatrician does refer you for resources or for an evaluation, oftentimes many parents turn to early intervention. What is early intervention? It's a system of coordinated services like speech therapy, occupational therapy, and physical therapy that work to promote a child's growth and development. It's often referred to as EI. EI supports families during the early ages of birth to age three, and it's done on site in your home. Anybody can refer a child to EI. It could be a parent, a relative, a teacher, a friend. Um, and to make a referral, you call your local early intervention program. All cities and towns have one or more EI programs that can serve their residents. In Massachusetts, it's, it's recommended to call Family Ties of Massachusetts, Family T-I-E-S, if you have concerns. The next question is, how does a toddler do speech therapy? Um, this is interesting because you think children at this age aren't really ready to work. Well, their work is play, so it's all done through play. Um, Therapy occurs in a very natural context, like on the floor with trucks and trains and dolls, and a parent is often present during these sessions in order to watch and learn the different guided techniques. We use a lot of toys and play-based scenarios which are specifically designed to facilitate particular speech and language goals for that child. Therapy is a very dynamic process 
and requires the clinician to be creative and flexible in order to transform different play-based scenarios into thoughtful learning experiences for the child. So now that we have a general sense of what to expect from our toddlers, let's take a look at how we can help them acquire language. As a speech therapist and a mom, I've relied on these strategies myself, and I've seen a dramatic improvement in my own daughter's language development which has in turn drastically decreased her whining, crying, and general meltdowns, giving toddlers the power to feel that they can express their wants and thoughts makes for a much happier child and parent. So now let's take a look at the strategies to promote early language development. The first technique is positioning. It's important when you're playing with your child to get on their eye level. This may mean sitting on the floor so that you can be face-to-face -face in your interactions. Getting face-to-face -face allows for an easier connection. Both of you can see and hear each other's messages better. And it's easy for you to encourage your child's communication. Follow your child's lead. He'll be more motivated to communicate when he's engaged in something that interests him. Like if you sit down to play the farm toy with your child, and instead of engaging with you with the animals in the farm set, he instead grabs a toy car, follow his lead, comment on that toy car, play with the car, say beep, beep, tune into his interest at that very moment, not into your pre-planned play agenda. Other ways, to, other ways to follow your child's lead are to imitate his actions and interpret what he has shown you. If he carries a toy little toy cement truck across the room and gives it to you, label it for him. Wow, cement truck? Vroom, vroom. Make a comment about what your child is doing. I like to call this narrating. Think of yourself as a narrator to your child's play. If you observe your child playing with a car and tracks, and you see him pushing the car up the ramp and down the ramp, narrate that, give him that language. Push car up, whee, down it goes. Describe his actions for him while he's playing. And lastly, join into play. Another strategy is to take turns. Turn taking keeps the interaction going. I like to think of this strategy as a dance. If you're dancing with your partner and he takes a step, you take a step. When he stops, you stop. So turn taking is a precursor to conversation. You talk, I listen. I talk, you listen. Learning turn taking skills is a wonderful way to allow communication to grow. The longer you can keep an interaction going, the more opportunities to communicate will develop. Please note that turn taking absolutely can be introduced with a pre-verbal toddler. Start teaching this skill by labeling whose turn it is. For example, at mealtime, you might take a bite and say, Mommy's turn. Your child takes a bite next, and you say, Olivia's turn. Lots of repetition is key. Another way to keep the turns going are to imitate what your toddler does and says as a means of keeping the interaction going and teaching the power and fun of imitation. He bangs on a toy drum. Bam, bam. Just imitate the action. Bam, bam. Add a fun sound, and the interaction will keep evolving. <clears throat> Simplify your language and match it to the child's level so that he will be more likely to imitate you. Speaking at an expressive language level that is consistent with your child's level and sometimes slightly ahead will give your toddler the ability to imitate your words. Like when he says, car, to ask for a car, you might model, want car? When he sees a car and is labeling car, you might model, there's car? When he's making the car move, model, go car? When you're playing cars with him, 
take a, take a car and say, my car. So simplifying your language is important. It gives your child the opportunity to imitate. Single word vocabulary. I think it's important to mention that you should grow your child's single word vocabulary to be at least 50 spontaneous single words. These 50 words are spontaneously used by your child, and they're not imitated words. Before you begin working on two word combinations, please be sure your child has 50 single words. And if their vocabulary is not this size, just continue to work on adding new single words until it is. Please note that some children can imitate phrases before they're truly using 50 words on their own. In many cases, they're just learning these phrases holistically or as one unit. In other words, the entire phrase is just one long word to them. I remember our daughter learned open door as a holistic phrase. She applied that holistic phrase, open door, to anything that needed to be opened, a box, her yogurt container. If she wanted something in the diaper bag, she'd say, open door. She learned open door as a single word. The only way to know if your child's vocabulary is at the 50 word mark is to keep a list of all the words he says on his own and that are not imitated over a couple of days. So some more ways to build single words. <clears throat> you can label objects and make comments that your child can imitate rather than asking a lot of questions. For instance, while playing with cars, say things like, car, beep, beep, wee, down, instead of asking, what's that? What's the car doing? What color is it? Where did it go? Those are conversation enders. <laughs> be playful and engaging and try not to be a quizzer. <clears throat> Another fun thing you can do is to make really fun animated sounds while you play that your toddler will be interested in and able to imitate. Fun sounds and words are said with a lot of animation and are easy for children to remember. Add gestures and you'll have your toddler imitating and laughing in no time. Like when you go to the park, go down the slide and toss your hands over your head and yell, Wee! guarantee your toddler will be right behind you doing the same thing. Other fun sounds and words to try include boom or vroom vroom, ouch, yuck, pop, chaka chaka, up and down, and whoop. Use great rises in your intonation and use your voice and tone to get your toddler's attention. We often label using nouns and names of people when we label, like train or daddy. But when you think about moving forward with language development, a child needs more than nouns to start combining words. Children also need social words like hi and bye requesting words like more and please, verbs and action words like go, eat, sleep. They need early pronouns like me and mine, I and you, prepositions like in, out, off, up, negation such as no, don't, can't, adjectives and adverbs and descriptive words like fast or yucky or big. So when your child is ready to move to the two word combination, be sure you're teaching words from these different categories so that your child has a broad vocabulary base in order to make phrases. A good way to do it is to take a look at your child's single word vocabulary. Using all of the single words in his inventory, start to model two word combos with these words. For example, if you know your child can say the word big, and he can also say ball, you'll start to model big ball. Wow, big ball, that's a big ball. You're almost guaranteed they can produce the two word combination. Add melody to your speech to make it more fun and interesting. Adding melody to your speech will increase your child's desire to tune in and will increase the likelihood of him imitating what you say. More juice. 
prolong your vowels and slow your speech. Repeat, 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 then repeat. Repeatedly model sounds and words and encourage your toddler to imitate. You may think that you're sounding repetitive, but children really do benefit greatly from highly repetitive models. Clap out the sounds. If you notice your toddler is leaving out a sound to a particular word, another great technique to use is clapping or patting the floor to help your toddler feel word parts. Our daughter started referring to me as Ma. We used this technique with her to tap Mommy on a toy drum. Tap, tap, and cheer. Mommy. We put emphasis on the dropped sound. Within the next few days, I was really delighted to start hearing mommy for the first time. Many early words like mommy, daddy, bye bye, baba, and night night are two syllables. Try this tapping trick to target words with sounds that he already tries to say. Animal sounds are great to tap with, too, such as moo, moo, or ba, ba, nay, nay, quack, quack, woof, woof. Feeling out these words and sounds are really great for phonetic development. Another great technique is to use starter phrases. When something is familiar and repeated often, it becomes automatic. Using books that offer repetitive themes like brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? I see a is a starter phrase. This allows kids to predict and recognize that tagline that is repeated over and over. Aside from books, starter phrases are great in play, too. For instance, before turning on the music of a toy or throwing a ball to your toddler, stop and look at them. Say, one, two, and wait. Or you could try, ready, set, and wait. When you wait, stand and look expectantly at your child, making eye contact and smiling. Anticipate their language. It's coming. You can also make up your own cute phrases at home. Just be sure that your fill in the blank is an age appropriate word. At our house, we say, I love you to the moon and back. Teach your child the power of communication and require him to communicate via signs, sounds, or words in order to acquire objects that he or she wants. Phrases like show me or tell me are fantastic. Communication with your toddler really opens up a brand new horizon. You begin to see them develop as a real little person, expressing their thoughts. Pretty cool stuff, I think. This is what it's all about. I think we have some questions, Nancy? We have a lot of questions, and a lot of questions have come in. So um, I know that we pulled out some themes for some of the questions, and I think that's a good place to start. And um, a couple of questions started out about mispronunciation. So several questions um, about how and when do you begin to correct mispronunciations, um, and when do you uh, when is that an issue? Are there particular uh, mispronunciations that are more common than others? Sure, absolutely. Um, I think it's important to notice that um, in learning to talk, there will always be mistakes. Like in learning to walk, you trip and you stumble. And when you're learning to talk, you trip and you stumble over your words. So when a new child is learning to talk, it's absolutely developmentally appropriate for them to have different sound errors. And um, the way we look at it as speech language pathologists is there are certain sounds that develop at certain age ranges. So, for example, I would not expect a two-year-old to be able to say the word squirrel. Um, there's too many sounds in there that are developmentally more appropriate for a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old to be able to pronounce. So I think it's more important to break down the actual sounds that your toddler has and look at their age level. 
Um, and if, if you're having a difficult time as a parent understanding them, then there may be some need for, for an outside evaluation. All right. Um, another question theme that came in was about babies being born prematurely. And I know I see this question often uh, in terms of infant development. Um, often I find that uh, for a baby that was born uh, maybe uh, 32, 34 weeks in that range, um, often the social development uh, will will develop a little bit closer to actual age, whereas some of the motor skills seem to develop closer to corrected age. And for those people not familiar with those terms, corrected age means if the baby, instead of being born two months early, were born on their actual due date, uh, then, for example, at six months old, uh, they may be six months old chronologically, but they may have some developmental skills closer to a four month old, and that would be normal and expected. But where does language fall into this spectrum, and, and what are what are the the language milestones you might expect for a premature baby? I think it's important, like you said, to definitely take into account the adjusted age. Um, and it's it's normal for premature babies to need as much as a year or maybe even two years to catch up to their peers with regards to their language development. Um, for parents of premature babies, I would I would ask them to look for specific warning signs, like looking at eye contact, being sure they're smiling and playing with their toys. Are they interacting with others? Um, do you feel they have a general understanding receptively of the language that's being said to them? Um, start looking for those early gestures or noises and those early sounds so that you know that they're starting to express themselves. Along those lines, um, a mom has emailed and said that her 18-month-old doesn't seem to have any real words and she's secretly concerned about autism. She wants to know, how would I know if this is just a slower language development or something more like autism? Autism now can be detected from a very detected from a very early age, so I would I would ask to look for some red flags. Um, does your baby cuddle with you like you see other babies cuddling? Um, does your baby notice if you're in the room? Do they notice certain noises? For example, maybe he seems to hear a car horn or a cat meow, but not attend to you when you call his name. Does he ever prefer to play alone or seem to tune others out? Does he not seem interested to play with toys, but likes to play with random objects in the, out, in the house? For example, would he rather hold a ballpoint pen than a favorite lovey or a stuffed animal? Or maybe he says the ABCs or numbers or words to TV shows, but can't use words to ask for things in an older child. And lastly, does he not seem to be afraid at all, not afraid of anything? So these are just some different red flags to possibly look for that can help distinguish a classic language base or speech delay versus something more that could be um, on the autism spectrum. You know, and listening to you list some of those uh, pink flags or red flags in terms of uh, infant and toddler development, it did make me want to reassure parents because uh, so many of these pink and red flags for developmental delays are also completely normally seen in young ch in infants and toddlers. The difference is that they're, that they're uh, kind of passing phases and the child continues to develop and progress. So it's very, very normal uh, for uh, an 18 month old to want to spin around in circles until they're dizzy and fall over. But you don't well, I guess you do see six-year-olds doing that, but you know, as that being a repetitive behavior. You also will very normally see a crawling baby at 10 or 15 months uh, play with um, uh, you know, a door handle or something that spins or something that's shiny and have that kind of you know, repetitive um, play behavior. But the difference between that you know, is that they'll also play appropriately with other types of toys and do some interaction um, as opposed to that being how they want to spend three hours of their day. Uh, so, so when you look at these lists of developmental risk factors uh, for autism, uh, I, don't want too much, I don't want parents to freak out too much because you will see some of these traits in your, in your child. You'll walk into the room and your child won't notice you and you'll think, oh my gosh, Megan said that's a sign of autism, when it may not be at all in your situation. 
So look at the big picture, not one or two single behaviors. Um, here's a question I just love. Uh, we've been using ASL, American Sign Language, um, or modified for baby sign. My mother-in-law, of course, says she heard it can delay verbal speech. I've read otherwise. When will he stop using the signs and start talking more? He's 18 months old and has quite a few words, but he still signs. So I love that question because I'm a huge advocate. Uh, we even begin showing some basic infant signs very early on in our new moms groups and our parenting groups at ISIS because just as you were mentioning, Megan, that receptive language occurs so much earlier than expressive verbal language. And so uh, at, at, at 10 months, your child may be able to do rudimentary signs for milk or for more or pick me up. Uh, and it gives you that insight into your uh, 12 or 15 month old, the things that they're noticing. You're outside and they sign bird or they sign flower. Um, and it just it helps them communicate with you better before they can verbally make all these sounds. And I think the research is pretty clear that it actually doesn't delay communication or language at all. It enhances it. And as your baby's verbal skills improve and they learn more words and their words are able to be understood by other people, uh, they want to be understood. They want to ask for a, a cracker and have somebody give it to them. So saying the word cracker is going to get them the cracker more than signing cracker to someone who doesn't know what the heck they're doing. Um, and so gradually they'll start using verbal words more than signs. But what I love is watching the toddler who uses their sign for emphasis. So they really, really, really want something. So they'll sign more as they say mock, mock. Um, and um, I, I, I'm, I think uh, that using sign as young as uh, five and six months old in the baby's gaze is a great benefit. Don't expect them to sign back until closer to nine months, uh, nine to 12 months is when you'll start seeing more and more signs. But I'm a fan. What about you? Oh, absolutely. It's really unlocked um, the potential of so many toddlers' language and really sparks off their language development. So it's uh, a really exciting milestone to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, that brought up a, a related question. Uh, in terms of um, the the emphasis, so I was I was saying about a, a child who uses the sign to really emphasize something that they feel passionately or they want desperately. Uh, this mom says that her twenty her twenty two month old child often speaks very emphatically about something of interest. When he gets really excited, what comes out sounds more like gibberish, um, and uh, she. She wants to know how can she help him turn this excitement into words. She thinks he's got a nice vocabulary coming along, um, but uh, when he's excited, he's very difficult to understand. Sure, and, and that is something that we refer to as intelligibility. Um, so it's very common for a child's intelligibility to decrease as their length of utterance increases. Um, so if a child's saying one word, like phone, um, it may be very clear, but if they say, Mommy, telephone is for you. Where's your telephone? It might come out as complete jargon. Um, and it's not to say that they can't say it. It's just that they need to slow down, and um, their, their mouth and lips and oral musculature might not be able to keep up with how fast their brain is moving. Um, and so I think in that situation, it's really important to continue to um, pretend like your child said real words to you and go along with it. Um, you might just um, sort of interpret what they've said um, and maybe break it down for them, try to match your language to their language a little bit and back up a little bit. But I think that that's fantastic and it's definitely a good sign that language is emerging. Would you, would you cue this child to slow down a little bit or, or um, help him with that? Or a 22 month old is just too excitable to, to respond to that? I would cue to slow down by modeling slower speech. I wouldn't use the word slow down. I would just say, mommy's telephone, use some of the strategies that we talked about earlier. Okay. What about um, a similar question that several people asked um, about um, a child who has words but the words don't seem as clear uh, as some of his peers' words and, um, and stammering and stuttering as well? Sure, absolutely. Well. Um, I think it's important to note that a lot of toddlers and many, many toddlers stutter when they're learning to talk. Um, I think of this as learning any new skill. If you're learning to ski, you fall down. If you're learning to read out loud, you make mistakes. If you're learning to talk, you stutter. Um, it's just something that happens over the course of a child's development. 
if that stuttering goes on for longer than six months and is consistent, there possibly may be a need to be concerned. Um, but many children stutter even longer than six months. And so um, something I think to look at is to take into account um, parents' um, family history of stuttering. If, if a paternal mother or father um, has a history of stuttering, then there's a little bit more um, need for alarm. But generally, stuttering is a very common course of language acquisition in toddlers. Here is uh, a question that I had to chuckle at, and I bet you're going to feel the same. Um, does television help or harm toddler ability to sleep? What about shows like Dora and Sesame Street? Does it help or slow down their speaking skills? Well, I have an answer. I bet you have an answer. I don't know if they're the same, but I guess we'll find out. <laughs> I bet they are. Um, let's be real. How old is your, is your child, Megan? She's 18 months. 18 months. Okay. Um, and I am an 18-year-old <laughs> and a 15-year-old. and. Um, 18 months, I, I think any mom that has an 18 month old knows that in real life, sometimes you just gotta use that video. You know, and, and when my kids were young, I liked a video over a television show because I felt the video was very parent controlled. With a television show, if you did not get there at just the right moment, it would roll into the next show and then all hell would break loose if you tried to inter intervene and shut the TV off. So at least with the video, you've got that choice. You know you can pick a 12-minute or a 15-minute, however long you need the break. But make no mistake, using the video is a way for you to get uh, decompression time and have your child sit and be, uh, be busied in a passive way. It's extremely passive learning. It's not damaging their brain as long as, long as it's very intermittent. Um, and you're using it mindfully. But it is not beneficial to their learning or to their language skills because those things must be interactive. And there's a study that I love that showed that kids can, young toddlers young, or preschoolers could watch a video of how somebody opened up a box to get to an exciting toy, and they would have to watch the video four or five times until when they were presented with the box, they could open it on the first try. Whereas when the same test was done and a, a person opened the box in front of the child in person, they could open the box to get to the exciting toy the very first time. It was an interactive, uh, three-dimensional learning experience for them, not a two-dimensional uh, video. So I say uh, TV is not beneficial to, your, to the baby's development, but we live in the real world and you will need to use uh, the DVD player on long car rides and you will enjoy having a 20 minute or 30 minute video while you're making dinner after a long day. Uh, Megan? I am 100% on board with you, Nancy. <laughs> Um, there's nothing like the power of play and the power of interaction. So those are definitely key to um, how a child learns. And um, you know, being a mom of an 18-month-old, there's definitely times where I do need to turn that TV on for 15 or 20 minutes to get things in order. Um, but it, it's not replacing what we do in person with our kids. So. So many questions came in about uh, bilingualism, and one thing that made me think of that is, you know, the examples that this mom's question brought up, Dora, Sesame Street, certainly choosing, uh, choosing the videos and the shows wisely is, is going to be key. Um, but I wonder about shows like Dora that, uh, that, that allows, introduce uh, some language, uh, a, a second or a third language. Um, you know, they may they may pick up a little a little bit of the sounds and so on, but that's not the way you learn a language. You must have language immersion to to truly and fully learn a language. So that could be in the home with one parent or both parents. It could be in a in a daycare center, uh, which is a, a bilingual or a Spanish speaking daycare center or a child care provider. Maybe you have a nanny who comes to the house who speaks Russian all day to the child. Um, I personally think that that's a, a huge benefit and a gift. Um, but Megan, you know, you many many questions came in as you know on this topic. So sure, I think I think one um, really helpful strategy that I've been um, using in my practice is to help kids organize the language. So if they are learning two languages, as Nancy, Nancy mentioned, um, you know, perhaps mom speaks Spanish only, dad speaks English only. So you're organizing the language based upon parents. 
Um, another fun way to do it is to um, pick typical routines during the day. Um, for example, maybe the child is exposed to English all day long, and at bath time they learn French. And all of the vocabulary words, all of the verbs, all of the phrases are in French only during bath time. The rest of the day, it's all English. As the child becomes familiar with the bath time routine, maybe you add breakfast. Um, so organizing, finding a way that works for you and your family to organize the language and how it's presented, um, I think is something that's really helpful for young children. Good. All right, let's see. Um, I think we'll just have time for one last question. And I know you touched on this, um, but uh, I think it's a great question because I think it's a very real life question. And a lot of parents probably wonder and worry if they're doing this right. Um, I find myself quizzing my daughter a lot in an attempt to get her to engage and speak. I know she knows what is this, and I point to the cow picture, but she doesn't respond. I can understand her resistance to answering my questions all day, but what are the other ways to get her to engage, to use the words she knows, how can she string those words together? So this is very much sort of an overview of all the strategies that we use. Um, I think probably the number one way to shut a child down is to ask them questions. <laughs> they, they're not interested in answering your questions and they don't want to be quizzed. It makes everybody nervous, um, especially a young child who's learning to talk. So I think of, um, of, of really interacting with your child in a very play-based way. Um, rather than saying, what's this to the cow? start saying, moo, moo, what is the cow doing, moo? And act really silly with your toddler, and they will definitely start saying, mommy, cow, moo. And if you make it fun and you engage them, um, that's the way to go about getting them to talk. Awesome. Awesome. All right, well, I think we are just about out of time, and um, I really want to thank you for sharing all of your expertise. We will uh, send an email out tomorrow with a link to the presentation recording. Um, we'll also include some resources, some we mentioned, and some additional language resources for you. And let's see, I'll pull the, the next slide up so you have um, uh, Megan's contact information. And um, Megan, I know your, your website has some great uh, FAQ areas on there and um, a link to your blog where you have a lot of uh, great language related toddler information. Um, another area we really didn't speak about but also is something that, uh, that Megan has expertise in is in oral motor and feeding and sensory information. And so um, I enjoyed, because that's a topic I'm interested in, I enjoyed looking at those areas of the website and reading some of the, the feeding questions. And I know, I know that many of you here in the audience have toddlers uh, and are concerned about picky eaters and sensory eaters. And so there will be some very good information on Megan's website for you to, to take a look at that as well. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, I'll include a link in uh, the email tomorrow. Next Monday evening, we have another evening uh, expert speaker webinar, and that one is on uh, baby proofing, child proofing, and home safety. So that's one that you'll definitely want to return for. Thanks, everybody, for coming, and have an excellent evening.